I'm sharing my screen. And that's the fun fact of the day is that putting a vibrator on your face feels cool, courtesy of my housemates. All right. Um, let's see how this goes today, because I was supposed to spend that last five minutes prepping and looking over stuff, but instead, uh, someone's putting a bullet vibrator up my nose. So let's talk about government and corporations and hopefully they'll remember. Um, what marketing has been included with food stamps in the mail? Food Cigarette stamps. coupons. Cigarette coupons, that's correct. Which population in the United States has seen the largest opioid overdose increase? Which demographic? White. Actually, no. Native, no? native populations. It's oh. commonly believed that it's rural white populations, but actually native populations have seen a massive overdose increase. Which amendment legalized enslaving prisoners? 13. That's right. What percentage of the world's prisoners does the U.S. contribute? 25. Nice. You guys are on it. Okay, so I'm sure that all of you have heard the phrase big pharma at one point or another in time. Um, and this is basically this theory that like the pharmaceutical industry is big bad guys, right? Like they are trying to get you. Um, there's a lot of mistrust around the pharmaceutical industry. And today we want to kind of take a look at where exactly that mistrust comes from and the potential val validity of it and like how we can kind of address this going forward, right? So um, one of the major things that started causing mistrust in the pharmaceutical industry is this concept of overprescribing, right? And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this in the context of the um, opioid crisis, but this goes back a little bit further than just doctors overprescribing. There are many reasons that we might have seen that increase in prescriptions. There are other reasons why we might have seen things like benzodiazepines become a problem because of lack of education. But um, companies like Purdue and Pfizer and GSK or GlaxoSmithKline were all corporations that had accusations of kickbacks. And a kickback is basically an illegal bribe. It's common in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, this is effectively where either lobbyists or other like corporate interests can go to doctors and effectively bribe them and be like, you should prescribe this drug. And in exchange, we will wine and dine you, we will give you benefits and perks, or we'll just straight up pay you. So in Nigeria, for instance, this is something we'll look at in a couple of weeks, um, codeine is one of the substances that's being pushed around through a lot of kickback systems right now at this point in time because people are effectively bribing pharmacists to give massive quantities of codeine. Now, one specific example of this is Dr. Kapoor and Subsys, which is a sublingual fentanyl spray that was on the market. And it's extremely expensive. It can cost between $3,000 and $30,000 per month. And Dr. Kapoor intentionally told his representatives to upsell fentanyl spray to people that did not need it. So people that really mainly need fentanyl spray are chronic pain patients, particularly cancer patients, which is what many opioids were developed specifically for. And he explicitly was like, you should just try and market this to other people. And it was a huge scandal. Um, and there were insurance agents that were involved in this process. It was just like an example of the corporate chain really getting corrupted from the ground up and like leading to what could have been like a major part of the opioid crisis. And then of course there's marketing as well. Um, the majority of money spent by pharmaceutical companies is not on R&D or research and development, but instead on marketing and sales. Um, so the United States, for instance, all those ads about like, Cymbalta can help. The United States is one of the only countries, one of the only wealthier countries that is, that allows pharmaceutical advertisements. In other countries, that shit's weird. Like, why would you like look to your TV to see what to treat your mental health condition with? It's a very strange practice. Um, every single major antipsychotic drug producer has been part of massive lawsuits. And this has been in the context of either like withholding information from patients about the validity of a substance, um, accepting kickbacks or bribes and false advertising. So for instance, saying that a drug was effective and safe for like children or seniors or people with certain conditions when it was not at all proven to be so. Um, now I'll just go ahead and say that this is, you know, it's problematic in its own right, but also it's SNL and it's also kind of hilarious. So like, let's take a look at it and then we can kind of point out some potential issues with the depiction of meth in this. Always, every time. 
So, to be clear, not getting most of the audio. Oh no, really? Oh. Hmm. Anyone else have that issue with the audio? Okay, hang on. How's this sounding right now? So okay? Mike changed. Mike is okay? Um, it sounds like whatever your reason before you switched to your main mic. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I moved my uh, my little desktop sound elsewhere. So okay, as long as you guys can hear me, mostly. Can you? Uh, mostly, yeah. Okay. Previous mic was better. Damn. Mm -hmm. And I guess what in the interest. All right, we're back. Better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so detailing is another part of this, um, which is basically like sending representatives from your pharmaceutical company to wine and dine physicians and other doctors and be like, you should prescribe this drug. It's effectively like it's kickbacks are different. They're like monetary bribes, whereas detailing is going in. It's like an interpersonal thing. It's like developing a relationship. Um, these are some major pharmaceutical companies that have incurred. This is like seven thousand eight hundred eighty one million dollars in penalties, for instance, just from GlaxoSmithKline. I think they make a billify, but I'm not positive. Um, and a shitload of sell settlements that have been pushed through courts because of false marketing and false advertising, um, kickbacks and detailing. Now, detailing is not legal anymore, especially because doctors are like prescribing a lot more generic drugs. This is like partially attributable to the fact that Detailing is no longer legal, like it was explicitly outlawed. What but do you mean detailing? Oh, never mind. Detailing is when they send in a representative to wine and dine and basically be like, you should prescribe our drug over other drugs. So it makes it a very capitalist corporate exchange to determine what drugs should be prescribed to which patients, which obviously is an issue because each patient has unique brain chemistry. Now, this leads to the problem of, of price gouging, and I'm sure that many, if not all of you, are familiar, at least in part, with the issue of price gouging in the United States pharmaceutical system. So this is an issue of accessibility and an issue of like privatized American healthcare, but this is the amount of increase from December 2014 to January 2016, this was a couple of years ago, the percentage of the increase in price for these drugs. So um, Daraprim was a 5,500% increase in its price over the course of like a year and a half or like just over a year actually. Is that how time works? Yes, that's right. So effectively different corporations are given what could be considered to be monopolies by the government and this is because of an issue with like privatizing the process of drug manufacturing and patenting, and we'll come back to drug patenting in a second. Um, but the real problem here is that there's no federal ceiling. There's no oversight on how much these drugs can cost, basically how much you can charge for them. I'm sure many of you remember whatever that shit bag's name was who hiked up the price of HIV medication overnight like crazy. I forget what his name is. Is it Shrekley or something like that? Shrekelly? Corelli, <laughs> that one. Um, and because of this, you can basically consider this to be a negotiation between the insurer and the private corporation of the insurer being like, well, I mean, you can only charge this, we'll only cover this much, et cetera. So there's no oversight here. Like they could basically come in and just like sweep the rug and charge whatever the fuck they want, which is like a heinous issue because about one in every five Americans cannot afford or experience this monetary issue from paying for their own medication. Now, Shkreli, okay, Shkreli, Shrekli. <laughs> this becomes even more apparent when we look at um, orphan drugs, for instance. An orphan drug is a drug that is made for fewer than 200,000 patients. So it costs, so if we're looking at this here, um, 
the cost of developing an orphan drug, which is like for a small subset of people, is far lower than the cost of developing a non-orphan drug, like for the general populace, but they make almost double the profit because they can, because this is targeted so, towards such a small group of people, basically, this demographic is small enough that they can effectively charge whatever the hell they want because those people need that drug and no one else is making it. And we'll come back again to why patenting is important. Oh wait, actually, that's right here. So this can mean that some medications cost up to $400,000 per year. $400,000 per year, because these companies can just do what they want. Um, in addition to this, these same corporations will often send in lobbyists to go into legal situations and say, basically, we want to support or not support this particular law, often pertaining to like federal oversight on making pharmaceuticals or like anything related to the pharmaceutical industry that could threaten this profit margin. Corporations will send in lobbyists to basically be like, let's sit down, Joe, let's have a chat. Let's like talk about this upcoming bill and convince them to do otherwise. And obviously more, you know, legal terms than that. Now, the patent part of this is what really makes it sticky. Usually when a corporation goes to patent a drug, there's a 20 year maximum patent duration on it that basically says, this is our drug, no one else can make it, it's ours, blah, blah. After that 20 years is up, that corporation can reapply for the patent and otherwise if they don't reapply for the patent or if they can't get the patent or something happens, um, then it becomes generic. Like that drug becomes accessible to be made by like any number of other companies. It's like a specific chemical that's produced not under a brand name, but as the chemical itself. So an example of this would be um, the active ingredient of Tylenol is acetaminophen. So you'll find acetaminophen by itself under different brands than the name Tylenol or just like as straight up like generic acetaminophen. And it's often way cheaper than brand name drugs because of this fact. So choosing generic drugs over brand name drugs has a lot of advantages because they should be the same thing approximately. However, there is also an issue of overseas production for, non or for generic drugs where the quality control has been shown to actually be quite a lot lower than we realize when we're importing from overseas. So that's another one that gets really kind of complicated, but the gist of it is that orphan drugs, really expensive for a small number of people. Patents last 20 years. After that, other people can make that drug. But if the company that made the drug in the first place after 20 years decides that they want to repatent it, they can go in and make a little tweak to the drug. Maybe the binder is different, maybe the release is different, something like that, and all of a sudden the patent gets renewed. So this sets up a system where it's really easy to monopolize um, and corner a market on a particular drug or treatment regimen because of this. So the alternative to this, obviously, if you can't afford these really expensive brand name drugs and generic drugs aren't even being made for a while, et cetera, is to import from overseas. So a lot of people will import drugs from across the pond or Canada or whatever, and this poses a lot of problems. The reason being that, um, well, first I should say that the cost of drugs in the U.S. is way higher than in other areas. Like this is the U.S. versus the U.K., this chart right here. So in the U.K., certain drugs are just like way, way, way cheaper than in the United States, way cheaper. Now, when we're bringing in, when we're importing drugs from overseas, we really don't have very much in the way of quality control of like source testing, anything like that. So what we end up seeing is that there are a couple things that can happen from imported drugs that are like not directly from brand or like produced in the US or quality controlled by the FDA, et cetera. Either the drug that you get will not actually treat the problem it's like something else, it's, it's just a waste of time. Either it's just like something that is inert or it's something that is meant to treat a different thing. Alternately, it could be of poor quality or contain toxic ingredients, et cetera, and can cause completely new original ad additional health problems because of this. So we see a lot of preventable deaths, 450,000 malaria deaths approximately, that are preventable from counterfeit pills, from fake pills, because we have such an inaccessible healthcare system, kind of globally, honestly, that people will just get like inert shit to treat a completely preventable disease, which is absolutely awful. We see that approximately one in every 10 pharmaceuticals in the United States is counterfeit. 
um, one in every four in less wealthy countries, and about 50%, 50% approximately of the pharmaceuticals sold online through websites are like counterfeit. Now, most of the time, this just means that they're inert. They just like don't really have what they're supposed to or they don't have enough of it. Sometimes it's just like poor quality or it's not dosed correctly. That's really common. And sometimes it's just like completely different, like entirely separate drugs altogether. Now, because of this, there's a massive market, obviously, for illicit pharmaceutical imports and exports. And also the profit margins are really easy to widen if you just reduce your standards of manufacturing, right? That makes sense. If you're an overseas drug producer and you recognize that there's very little oversight happening from the countries that are importing your drugs, but people still need them because they can't afford the drugs in their home country, then you could just like cut corners and it makes it super easy and highly incentivized to do so. Now, we're gonna switch gears briefly over to this thing called publication bias. And I want you all to keep this in mind whenever you're doing your own research on drugs. The concept of publication bias is essentially, I know there's a lot going on in this slide, it's a mess. Essentially, if 50 people do a research paper on an established subject and five of the results say like, okay, this is like, or maybe even let's say two of the results are different than the other 48 results. All those other 48 papers only a couple of them will probably get published because magazines and scientific journals and peer reviewed things are gonna be like, well, there's a lot of evidence about this already. We don't need to like review and publish all these articles. They're just supporting an existing theory. But these two additional articles that said something contradictory will probably both get published because they have something contradictory. So it sets it up where we have like, even if there are like 10,000 papers supporting this idea that like X drug is safe in moderation, but there's like 100 papers supporting this idea that X drug is not safe in moderation, there might be an almost equal representation of those two different presentations of this substance on the internet. So we can kind of see how that might be not so good of a thing, right? Thinking about how if you are just a lay person Googling like does MDMA cause neurotoxicity, and there's like 50 articles that are like, no, it doesn't, but two that are like, yes, it does. You might see an equal representation of both of those viewpoints. So both sides is, yes. And this is a really hard thing because it pushes researchers to want to get results that are contradictory. Like the more contradictory your results, the more controversial your results, probably the more likely it is that your paper will be published and read. So this is also like really makes it tough to do your own research on the internet. Now, selective publication is another thing with this, um, wherein pharmaceutical companies can basically do a bunch of tests and they will pull the, the research that they did that supports whatever it is that they're doing and publish that. Basically means that they can throw out stuff that they don't like, stuff that does not support what they're doing. Now, I know that this chart is crazy looking, <laughs> it's like not great. But what I want you to take away from this basically is that if you are doing your own independent research on drugs and you're looking at scientific journals, which is probably one of the only things that you should look at for the most part and it's not news articles so much, when you're doing that, you need to be very attentive to not only looking at the results, but also the way that they talk about their methods. If they're like, many addicts are stupid then you probably, it's not gonna be that blatant, obviously, but like pay attention to the verbiage that they use and the way that they describe what they're looking at. Like if you, if you start an article being like, in this article, we like seek to examine the neurological effects of several dangerous uh, illegal drugs or something like that, it's probably gonna be biased. It's probably gonna not be a very reputable article. You also need to look at the people that actually did the study. And I know this sounds like a pain in the ass and it is, it takes time to really actually look things up. I don't even say the word research because research requires so much more than this, but you might find that if you're looking up the, the name of the person that published an article or the people that were involved in researching it, you might discover that they actually are like major investors in certain pharmaceutical companies, on the board of certain organizations, have published articles showing their biased stances on things before. So what I'm getting at is it's really hard to find good information on the internet. I think my housemates are playing Mario Kart. I just heard them screaming. Now let's take a look 
at the government. 1947 to 1953 was one of the first forays in the United States government, specifically the Navy, carrying out investigations and in how various drugs would impact laypersons. Mario Kart Wii. Of course. <laughs> I won the cup last night. I would just like to say that. It's because I got the quacker. Dry bones and the quacker. That's my speed combo. So the United States Navy would carry out basically mind control investigations. And this is the U.S.'s favorite thing to do. It's like they wake up in the morning, they roll out of bed, they like make themselves some coffee and they're like, man, why don't we just like try and control the behavior and thought patterns of the masses? That sounds like a great use of our time today. So they would often pull subjects that were marginalized, mentally ill subjects, prisoners, etc., cetera, um, impoverished people, people of color. And they would use drugs like scopolamine, which we'll come back to. I'm sure some of you are at least a little bit familiar with scopolamine, um, and mescaline and LSD. And oftentimes people just experience really severe and traumatizing psychotic episodes. In fact, many of the people in Project Chatter were dosed on acid every single day to measure this and like in, in increasing doses, which could very easily lead to psychosis, especially if people are highly stressed and not sleeping effectively. Now, how many of you are familiar with this concept of the Manchurian candidate? Only one. Interesting. That actually surprises me. Two. Okay. So the Manchurian candidate is the CIA's wet dream. Probably literally, if I had to guess. It's this concept of finding this perfect brainwashed fighting machine, basically. You want to find someone that is perfectly suggestible, that you can control, whose actions you can monitor. And the way they wanted to do this was breaking someone's psyche effectively and inserting their own ideologies into it. So they used all kinds of techniques. This is in the early 50s, right after Project Chatter. It was like a nice, smooth, beautiful transition. Um, and this time they were, this one was like specifically, oops, for like mind control and interrogation techniques. They often want people to crack. This one is also about mind control, but more specifically, they want to find a way to have this person become a perfect fighting machine for the United States. That's basically the Manchurian candidate. Now, again, this was on weaker members of society. We'll see this over and over again is that we just like test our drugs on people that we deem to be lesser. And they wanted to completely reduce a person's identity to nothing and replace it with something new. That was the whole idea. Which brings us to MK Ultra. I know that this is hopefully something that you, at least many of you have heard of in the past. This was the 50s and 60s. Um, part of this, Project MK Ultra, was basically saying, the Russians are doing it, we're sure, we have no proof, but like the Russians are, I guess, probably trying to control people's minds and make perfect killing machines. So we have to do this to defend ourselves. That was the general argument. Now, MK Ultra is one of the most controversial government plans ever. Um, many of the people that were involved in this program did not consent. And they were frequently using things like psychedelics in particular, shock therapy, inducing paralysis in people, but also just like conjoined injections of barbiturates and cocaine and like all kinds of drugs that make a person vulnerable. But they didn't just stop at drugs. It was also torturing people using sensory deprivation, sexual assault. All of these things were used in MK Ultra. The whole idea was to break someone as hard as possible. Uh, I think we're going to skip this. So when this, if this was found out, basically, in 1973, the files pertaining to this program were all destroyed, except for a very small few. I think that there are a couple that are floating around on the internet. But they employed things like torture and sensory deprivation and, like, obviously drug use on populations like children. And on the CIA members themselves at one point. In fact, it became kind of a common thing that people would show up to work at the CIA and sometimes would just get dosed with acid without realizing it. So the level of mistrust within the CIA itself is 2020 the sequel to MK Ultra. Ouch. So we're gonna come back to one such CIA member who was dosed unconsensually, Frank Olson, in just a second. But, this wasn't just limited to like 
like this was like every marginalized sphere you could think of was pulled into MK Ultra, like frequently, like I said, very unconsensually. And they wanted to induce a state of delirium. It was basically trying to find Veritas serum from Harry Potter, for Platter Nerds here. One of the ways that they did this was through Operation Midnight Climax, which is where the CIA members would go out and they would find sex workers and they would hire them and say, you need to seduce these men and bring them to this room with a one-way mirror behind which CIA operatives will sit, seduce the man, dose him with LSD, and leave, basically, and just see what happens. But this ended up being massively scandalous, obviously, because the CIA agents behind the glass ended up just kind of partying about it, just having a, a good old time in the meantime. All right, we know what LSD is. We're in drugs, though. Yeah, great use of taxpayer money, am I right? Talk about our trillion-dollar defense budget. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about Frank Olson. He was a CIA operant, and he, at one point, went to this dinner, basically, because he'd, he'd started getting a little bit uneasy with what was happening with everyone being dosed. I just ate an icebreaker, so I'm, like, going to be swallowing a bunch. Sorry. So... He knew what was going on with the CIA. He was starting to get a little bit uneasy. He was like a bio engineer. I forget exactly what his role was. And at one point he was invited to this dinner party with this general and some other important people. And everyone there was dosed. And it was basically, he came to realize, kind of like a loyalty test to see how well they would operate while being under the influence of LSD. I don't know about you guys, but that sounds pretty bad to me. So Frank Wilson kind of fails the test basically because he's like deeply traumatized by it and really upset. And then he's taken to see this doctor in another city and there's some scandalous stuff that happens there in terms of like stories not lining up. And then he's taken away from the city and then brought back to the city to see the doctor again. And he's booked in this hotel room on the 13th floor and Nine days after being dosed, he is dead from falling out of this hotel room window onto the pavement below. Now, initially, this was ruled to be a suicide, but to this day, Frank Olson's child has been continuously pushing to investigate his father's death. There's a huge settlement made by the CIA. Um, there's Wormwood, which we're not going to actually show the trailer here. It was on Netflix. I haven't seen it, but I've heard that it was really good. And he basically was, like, starting to get uncomfortable, and the general prevailing consensus, kind of, there's not really a full consensus, is that it seems like he was probably pushed from behind, like he was knocked out, blood force trauma to the head, and pushed. So this is, like, a major scandal in terms of MK Ultra and the CIA. And one of the things that, like, really, I think this was at the tail end of it when it was starting to grind to a halt. So that's the U.S. doing its own thing. Now, the U.S. doing its other thing is much more sinister in many ways, actually, just because the United States, in case you guys weren't aware, really, really loves being involved in other countries' business as much as possible, actually, like really to the fullest extent that it can. So um, the number of people that have been killed, like civilian deaths in the last couple of years, is like staggering in Mexico compared to the combination of Afghanistan and Iraq combined, right? Now, the US was not just involved in Mexico, but in also Nicaragua and Colombia, in Afghanistan and the airstrikes, I think last year or two years ago. So this goes all the way back to 1969 with Operation Intercept. And this was the Nixon administration basically saying, okay, in order for us to gain rapport with the citizens, especially because the Vietnam War was around this time and they were like really starting to push this like no to drugs thing, the Nixon administration basically called Mexico and was like, hey guys, there's a lot of weed in the US right now. And for reasons that I can't fully explain to you, it's your fault. You guys are not being uh, strict enough with your growers. You're not being strict enough with transportation across the border. So basically you need to like overhaul your entire country's everything right now to get this figured out because our kids are smoking weed. And Mexico is like, what? Like this really is kind of coming out of nowhere. Why are you saying this right now? It's your kids that want the weed. Like your guys are the ones that are bringing it into your country. Like this is not our problem. And Nixon was like, okay. And then a couple whatever's later, I forget exactly what the window was. 
he basically just like without saying anything to Mexico implemented Operation Intercept, which was where at the U.S. border, they just had these crazy car searches, like insanely intensive car searches. Now, this was intended to be a scare tactic. This was basically saying, A, the United States government is going to crack down on drugs right now. B, if Mexico doesn't cooperate, we're going to do it for them. And C, we're going to do this without Mexico's consent. So, of course, this ended up being a really serious issue, as we'll see over and over again with the U.S.-Mexico border, which is a huge hotspot in terms of drug trafficking and, like, a really visible way that social political issues rise in the drug war. Because this practice of making it so that it took, like, hours to get across the border, people were just, like, stuck in their cars all fucking day trying to get across the border. This practice really damaged the economies of border cities in Mexico. Now we see how this could be an issue, right? Like the U.S. basically threatens Mexico indirectly by saying, if you don't do what we want you to do on your end right now, we're going to make it possible for anyone to get into your country without extreme stress and your economy is going to suffer as a result. So it's a bottleneck. It was a very shrewd political move that was intended to make Mexico acquiesce. Like that was the whole point. They were pissed off. But it was intended to be a scare tactic, and we'll see this repeated later. Um, now, here's one that gets very sticky, the Iran-Contra scandal. And I don't know if many of you would associate this one directly with drugs. So I'll try and break it down to be as simple as possible. So in 1978, the Nicaraguan government was in the process of being um, overthrown, basically. There were right-wing rebels, there'd been recently like a, a socialist Nicaraguan government had been installed, and there was this group called the Contras, which were right-wing rebels that were trying to overthrow this new socialist government in Nicaragua. And the CIA was like, fuck socialism, we hate communists, like, blah blah, so we're actually going to support the Contras, this right-wing rebel insurgency, as they try and overthrow the socialists in the Nicaraguan government. That was the idea. Now, to facilitate this, the U.S. was basically kind of like, well, the, the accusation is that the U.S. was like, okay, we're going to kind of just like let you guys, aka the rebels, the right-wingers, we're going to just let you guys kind of do what you need to do with cocaine right now so you can make money so that you can overthrow this socialist government. Now, of course, this led to a spade of human rights violations, and there's this massive complicated web with how the United States got involved in this. It's not fully supported by evidence is the thing. There's a lot of conflicting evidence here, a lot of conflicting stories on how heavily involved the CIA was, to the point where there was this publication called The Dark Alliance that was put out in the 90s that accused the CIA of doing this, which was a massive scandal. But it, this wasn't just about, like, it, to break it down again, Socialist government in Nicaragua, U.S. doesn't like socialism. They support the right-wing rebels selling cocaine and overthrowing the socialist government. Right? That makes sense? Cool. It was one of America's most notorious presidential scandals that was cost Ronald Reagan his presidency. The Iran-Contra affair. In the early 1980s, the U.S. was still in a cold war with Russia, and anti-communist sentiment was strong. During his presidential campaign, Reagan promised to assist anti-communist insurgencies around the world. For a brief time under Reagan, the CIA trained and assisted groups fighting communist leaders abroad. Reagan was particularly interested in a group called the Contras and their battle in Nicaragua. The Contras were a group battling the Cuban-backed Sandinistas, a communist group who had seized power in 1979. Reagan called the Contras the moral equivalent of our founding fathers. But much of the Contras funding came from the cocaine trade. Because of this, Congress passed the Boland Amendment, specifically aimed at keeping American money from funding the group. That happened in 1982, shortly after Reagan took office. The amendment restricted the CIA and Department of Defense from using funds to provide military assistance to groups that were trying to overthrow Nicaragua's government, groups like the Contras. This did 
and stop Reagan. It was National Security Advisor Robert McFarland to help the Contras anyway, regardless of the cost. McFarland found opportunity. In 1985, an Iranian-backed terrorist group held seven American hostages in Lebanon. Reagan insisted his advisors find a way to bring the hostages home, saying, I want you to do whatever you have to do to help these people keep body and soul together. So with permission from Reagan, McFarland made a deal. The U.S. would give Iran weapons, and Iran would broker the release of the hostages. This happened even though Reagan publicly insisted he would not negotiate with terrorists and despite the fact that there was a trade embargo with Iran. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. The deal with Iran didn't just secretly secure the release of the hostages in exchange for weapons. There was money involved. While $30 million had been allocated for the weapons, the CIA funneled a portion of that money to the Contras in Nicaragua, the group Reagan supported in their guerrilla fight against the Sandinista government. In 1986, the Lebanese newspaper Al Shara reported the arms deal, and everything began to unravel. That prompted an investigation by the U.S. Attorney General, who discovered that only 12 million of the 30 million dollars actually went toward weapons for Iran. The rest of the money was sent to the Contras in Nicaragua. Right. Okay. So I know this is very complicated. So let's take a look at it. So the claim here was that. The United States was like, we hate communists, we love right wing, so we're going to try and get money to the right wing Nicaraguans rebels so they can overthrow the communists. So they not only basically were like, we're going to spend $30 million on weapons that we can get our like hostages back from Iran and lied about it and only spent some of the money on weapons and sent the rest of it to the Contras and we're like, shh, don't tell. But also, the claim is that the CIA, in the meantime, at the same time, was also supporting Nicaragua and the United States, like, kind of working together to make the cocaine smuggling trade happen. So Blandon, which is a Nicaraguan smuggler, was selling coke to Rick Ross, Freeway Ricky, and the CIA just kind of, like, cooperated with him. That's the claim. That's, that is the claim. You know what, I'm, what I mean? It's like, it's a claim. Um, so we have cocaine being transported to the United States. The United States gets its hostages back, but also sends money to the right wings. I know how complicated this is. I'm sorry. We're gonna, I don't think we have time for this. Now, moving on to Colombia, because Plan Colombia is just like an absolute disaster. Drug policy is such a mess. In 1996, the United States government was like, okay, Nicaragua, I'm sorry, Colombia, you have a lot of coke being made, like coca crops being grown in your country. So we're going to just like send you a bunch of money and you are going to destroy these coca crops. And that's perfect because that's, you know, how supply and demand works, obviously. So initially it was about destroying these crops, but then ultimately it became about supporting military efforts, of course, because that's what the United States does. Now, when Plan Colombia came into place, the vast majority of this money was sent into the military. They were like, okay, you know, we're going to give you all this dough and like maybe you spend a little bit of it on like economic assistance for, I don't know, the impoverished coca farmers who are doing this to survive. And the rest of it goes into your military. So we're just going to like beef you up with military stuff. And this has continued all the way until like a year and a half or so ago. Actually, it was like two years ago at this point, approximately. Um, at which point there was like a peace treaty that was signed or something. And the, the troops at, at least two years ago had not left the country yet. I haven't kept up. Um, but the problem that we see here is that we're seeing this huge amount of fumigation happening, right? Like a massive amount of pesticides being sprayed but the coca cultivation remains the same slash higher than it was before because people will just do what they need to do in order to make these crops grow because they're impoverished and it is an economic essential. So there are a lot of studies that have been done on this. And in the 90s, there were eight different ones that were released that all said 
this is actually making the drug trade more profitable because when you have less of a supply, you have higher prices, but the same demand. So the people that are able to take the risk and produce the supply just get paid more. That's it. They just get paid more. So this fumigation technique that they've been using as well has resulted in super coca, Boliviana Negra, which is um, resistant to Roundup. Interestingly enough, the United States government partnered with Monsanto to spray Roundup on the crops. Ah. These herbicides are toxic. They are toxic chemicals that are being sprayed upon civilian areas, and we'll see more of that in a second. But in order to prevent guerrilla crop growers and guerrilla fighting, um, there's food control being implemented. Like people are having their food intake watched. It's like all because of the cocaine trade. All of this is because of the cocaine trade. I guess actually we're not going back to that. Oh, actually we're gonna talk about environmental impacts, I think next time. Now let's go back to Mexico, the Merida Initiative. And this was more recently, 2007 to 2010. And I think I showed you guys a chart earlier of how in Mexico, the number of homicides, the number of murders was like, it was, you know, existent, but it wasn't crazy until 2007. And then it just shot up. The murder rate just like went through the roof. This was because in 2007, the U.S. government was like, fuck your drugs. We're going to give you a ton of money to spend on your military to fight drugs in your country. And Mexico was like, okay. So a bunch of equipment and aircraft things were provided by privately contracted defense corporations in the United States, right? Of course, like it's a privatized system. People profit off of war. Not like this is directly war, but it's war basically on Mexican citizens and in, in, in a sense. Now, this was basically the same thing as Plan Colombia, where the U.S. was like, oh, why don't we give you a bunch of money and we'll stop cocaine? So a bunch of people died and were displaced and environmental impacts happened and it's bad. And then the U.S. was like, oh, what if we did it again? But in Mexico, that sounds so fun. And Mexico was like, oh, I guess so. But didn't it not really work last time? But OK, that's fine. Now, most of the time, Mexico is producing weed and meth. Those are the two drugs that are most commonly produced in Mexico. Colombia is cocaine predominantly, but coke passes through Mexico, as with many, many other drugs. And this has created a very corrupted police system in Mexico. Very corrupted. It's a really, really serious problem. Now, in response to law enforcement efforts in 2007, we saw the price of cocaine go up. And then people kept buying it. So the people making money just made more money. <laughs> that was the result. And, and the number of homicides went through the roof. So that was the kind of double whammy result of this practice was that Coke got more expensive, but was still highly available. And also a bunch of people died. That was the Merida Initiative, been deemed a failure. Now, as part of this initiative, there was this, this thing called Fast and Furious, which was basically, again, turning a blind eye and saying, you can bring guns into our country. This was in full knowledge of the fact that these guns would end up in the hands of cartels. Like, this was a known thing. And at one point, they, they put on tracing to, it, the whole idea behind this was they would be like, okay, we're going to put tracing on these weapons so that we'll know where they end up. Um, but plot twist, doing so and just like funneling a bunch of guns into Mexico to see where they end up, ended in like 1,700 weapons being used to commit homicides. In late 2009, ATF agents in Phoenix noticed a flurry of gun purchases in the United States by suspected traffickers from Mexican drug cartels, including giant 50 caliber rifles. Instead of stopping the weapons, agents say their superiors ordered them to let the guns cross the border. It's called gun walking. Where they ended up and see if they would lead to a major drug cartel leader. Agents videotaped suspected dealers from Mexican drug cartels buying weapons. The case grew to include thousands of weapons. Then, in December 2010, two fast and furious rifles turned up at the murder of a Border Patrol agent in Arizona, Brian Terry. The Justice Department publicly insisted no gun walking had gone on. That denial prompted one of the lead agents on the case, John Dodson, to step forward and speak to CBS News. Here I am. Tell me I didn't do the things that I did. Tell me you didn't order me to do the things that I did. Tell me it didn't happen. 
Now you have a name on it and you have a face to put with it. Here I am, someone. Now, tell me it didn't happen. CBS News learned there were other alleged gun walking operations dating back to the Bush administration. In okay, this is a trend here, right? We see that, like, the United States wants something to get done. It requires violence or a lot of money. They want to support a group of people that are, like, trying to do something probably nefarious or they're just being stupid. So, like, why don't we just let that happen? Because. Right. Now, a couple of years ago in Afghanistan, Trump started doing airstrikes against opium labs. The problem with this is that new labs can be set up within three to four days, and that civilians and not the Taliban staff these labs. So they were just kind of like blowing up things that they assumed to be opium labs, and uh, then they would just reappear and a bunch of civilian civilians died in the process, and this ended in February 9, 2019, because it was a massive failure. The Trump administration is a massive failure. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. That's biased. Um, we're going to do that. Now, this is like kind of switching gears a little bit, but I wanted to kind of touch on this concept of the dark net. How many of you feel very familiar with the dark net slash web as concepts? Okay. Okay, a couple of you. So, this is a term that's thrown around a lot, and I think that fewer people actually fully understand it than we know. Now, where you are the vast majority of the time is on the clear net. This is just like the most surface level, skimmable, easily accessible portion of the internet. But then below that, you have the deep web. And it's important to note that deep web and dark net are often like spliced. It's like deep net and dark web. It's not that. It's deep web and dark net. The deep web is 90 to 96 percent of the content on the internet. And this is shit that you probably cannot access. This is medical records, subscriptions, financial stuff, organizational repositories, academic stuff, scientific stuff. And then below that, there's the dark net. Only 30 to 50,000 websites approximately exist on the dark net, and while that might seem like a lot compared to the rest of the internet, it is nothing. Now, on the dark net, you can get anything, and I do mean anything, although ordering hits on people is actually somewhat more complicated than it's, it's made out to be. But this was actually invented in the 1970s by MIT students in Stanford who wanted to be able to buy weed more easily, the dark net specifically. And it was intended to kind of avoid doing stuff personally and circumvent legality. Um, the Silk Road was definitely the best known of these. It was shut down in 2013. Actually, someone in drugs here a couple years ago was like next door neighbors with the guy who ran the Silk Net and was there for the shutdown. And they use cryptocurrency, which is better for anonymity, so like Bitcoin, etc. cetera. Um, frankly, oftentimes you can find better quality, more reliable substances on the dark net than in person, which isn't saying much because they're still pretty unreliable comparatively. But you can buy pretty much anything on the dark net if you know how to access it. Usually the way to do that would be going to a website like Agora, for instance, is one of the major ones operating at this moment in time. But it's not as simple as just going to a website. You can't just type in Agora dark net and be taken there. It requires a whole bunch of stuff that I'm not going to get into. But, oh, Agora shut down? No, there are offshoots of it up right now. There must be, 100%. I heard about it recently. We'll talk. Darknet's alive and well, folks. So if you're on Agora, or Agora as it was, you might see something like this. There's a lot of stuff on here. They literally are just like, you want some weed? You want some molly? Like, here it is. Here's four ounces of crystal meth. Like, you can buy anything. You can go through this and eat. Like, oh, and then there's American Greed, like, fired season of TV or something. But you can also get, like, services, um, information. You can get forged passports and identification documents on the dark net. Oh, I guess that video is down. So when it comes to accessing it, you know, it is not a walk in the park, and there's a reason that not everyone their brother is on the dark net but it is good to know that it exists and that this is a, a very popular way of 
acquiring drugs, drugs. Now, uh, just a quick foray into the world of privacy really quick, because this is something that drives me absolutely crazy. If you are talking about buying or doing or selling drugs, you shouldn't use unencrypted internet services like Facebook Messenger, which I guess actually I think is encrypted, but who cares? Or iMessage or texting even. Email, please don't use your email. Or Snapchat, which is everyone's favorite mode. But the fact of the matter is that if there's a warrant, you can go back the last 100 snaps and look at them. Yeah, messenger encryption, I do not trust at all. Now, to circumvent this, a lot of people will get what are called burner phones, which are basically these little shitty phone devices that you can use to make illegal transactions or do shady shit and then get rid of. Now, they're often known as like burn phones. Um, approximately 86% of wiretaps have been for drug investigations. And obviously there are also drug sweeps at schools and workplaces. How many of you went to a school where there were drug sweeps done? No one, one person. Interesting, interesting. In the past, I've had a lot of people in class that have. Oh yeah, yeah, they definitely do happen. Like po police will bring in drug dogs and like everyone will have to come outside and their like backpacks will get searched or like police will just like search your backpack or search your person. Like drug sweeps are pretty common in many areas of the United States. Probably less so now than they were a couple of years ago though. Yeah, I know several people who had that happen. So here's what police can and cannot access. If they have a warrant, they can see your texts and your emails that are less than 180 days old, so like six months, approximately. If they don't have a warrant, excuse me, they can see your older texts and emails, <laughs> records of your phone calls, who you're calling, who's calling you, IP addresses, public posts on social media, they can look through your garbage, very literally. Um, it's kind of sus on whether or not they can look at your geographic location using signal tracking. If you are arrested, verbally state, I do not consent to a search of my phone. Also verbally state, I do not consent to any searches. But before that, you should state, officer, am I being detained or am I free to go? If they don't say, you're being detained, over and over again say, officer, am I being detained or am I free to go? And if they continue to harass you, say, are you accusing me of committing a crime? And if so, which one? If they don't, answer that because cops are bullies and they will try and like get you to do what they want and they will like flat out bold face lie to you like cops will lie to you i've seen it happen it has happened to me cops will straight up tell you that a law exists that does not you are federally allowed to record police going about their business although there are some things um, that are like specific to specific states so before you record a cop you should check your state but cops will lie cops will lie if they say, if you just tell me this, we'll let you go, they will not say, I refuse, or I, I retain my right to remain silent or whatever, but like, yeah. They can recover deleted text. They can see the last 200 snaps. They're saved in a cloud before being deleted. <laughs> don't use Snapchat for your fucking drug deals. Just use anything else. Use, I don't know, signal. In red states, police can search your phone upon arresting you. In blue states, they need a warrant to. In yellow states, there's no set law, so it's mixed. This is the frustrating thing about having every state have their own laws. Um, let's take a look at how this is like awful. First and last name. My first name is Jesse. My last name is Snodgrass. Actually, I just noticed that we're out of time, so I'm going to stop this. But um, the basic of that video is that there was an undercover cop that spent a bunch of time befriending a kid who was on the autism spectrum in high school, and eventually was like, can you help me get some weed? And because this kid wanted to make friends, he went out and learned how to get weed and then sold it to this undercover cop who arrested him, even though this kid had probably never, I think he, he never smoked weed in his life. Classic example of the US drug system. Um, next week we will be talking about environmental impacts and then I think trip sitting is next Thursday, which is one of my favorite classes. Oh wait, actually that, that's this Thursday's environmental stuff, I think. And then after that is trip sitting, I believe. So hopefully I will see you guys then. Have a wonderful night and thank you.